This morning, our title is going to be a question uh, that Gideon asked in Judges chapter 6, verse 13 in our Old Testament. Uh, The judge Gideon uh, asked regarding God, where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? I think that's a good question. Where are the miracles? Uh, Gideon lived about 260 years after the time of Moses which the text will show us that this was a time period of of, uh, miracles that Gideon was most likely referencing here and certainly referencing. 260 years prior to Gideon was the time of the 10 plagues in Egypt. We know that story. Uh, 260 years was when God miraculously parted uh, the Red Sea by the hand of Moses and the Israelites walked through on dry ground. The Egyptians trying to do so were destroyed. During Moses' day, uh, God, after God brought up uh, Israel out of Egypt, we can also read about the giving of the Ten Commandments in the wilderness. God's voice thundered from the top of Mount Sinai so that the people trembled. Uh, they got to hear the voice of God, getting verification from heaven that God was speaking through Moses. It wasn't just a claim. He really was speaking through Moses. And they got to hear the voice of God. They got to see all these signs. God rained manna down from heaven so they could eat food in the wilderness during that generation and brought forth water from the rock so that they could drink. After Moses' death, uh, God led Joshua and the people in the conquest of Canaan, giving them the land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, You go back 260 years, all these amazing things before the time of Gideon. But here's the thing. Gideon wasn't alive to see all these things. Just like you and I were not alive to see all these things. Gideon only heard about these things. Years later, as they were taught to him, passed down, uh, written down in in Scripture and told to him. So for Gideon, it had been hundreds of years since God had shown any mighty works like those that were accomplished in the time period of Moses and Joshua. I suppose you could say after Moses and Joshua time frame, things uh, slowed down for a while with regards to God and his interaction in this way. There was a time period of rest, if you will, certain level of uninvolvement with regards to God, even though he was always watching. I suppose you could say that God let things run on their own for a little while. The Israelite people had been given the law of Moses by these mighty works that were produced. They had their promised land. They had inherited it. And now they were left with a time period to see if they would just adhere to God's law or not. A time period that followed, which was not about miracles and mighty wonders, but a time of testing as to whether or not Israel would follow God's laws or not. Uh, Of course, uh, what we see throughout the book of Judges is that the people often did not adhere to God's laws when left on their own devices and God didn't interact with them or speak or or, or he had a time period of rest and they disobeyed. And each man did what was right in his own eyes in uh, in the days of the Judges. So miracles stopped being shown for a little while. God stopped speaking directly, only leaving them his law. uh, And it turns out that the people chose disobedience. Uh, so let's go and read the, the context here of Gideon in Gideon's time period to see where we're at uh, so that we can look at the context about why he made this miracle statement. So Gen- uh, Judges, sorry, Judges chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And we've talked about the cycle in the book of Judges. They, they, they turn back to God and they start doing well. And then God starts blessing them and they start turning away from the Lord because of their many blessings. And then he brings a chastisement of some sort. And then they start wanting to turn back to God. And the cycle would just start going over and over again in the book of Judges. Uh, so here's, here's the, this cycle. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. So here's what the Lord did. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, the chastisement. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of, because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Uh, basically so they could hide from them. We'll see why. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Verse 4, uh, then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. 
and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. Uh, For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land and destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So there's the chastisement, right? And they're, they're going to go through this cycle, turning back to God because they don't like the way things are going. So you see what's happening here. Israel had grown wicked, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now God allowed the, the enemy to come upon them to chastise them in this way, uh, to discipline them. He allowed them to endure evil in hopes of turning their hearts back to him. So what happened was every time the Israel would plant a crop, the Midianites would come up upon their land and they would destroy it. Maybe set fire to their fields. They'd go around and pull up their crops. Sounds like they'd kill some of their animals. They would not let Israel prosper. And they would ruin the food that Israel was ready to harvest. So that this made food very scarce in the land of Israel during the time of Gideon. You can imagine how hard this would actually be if you put yourself in this time frame. How scary it would be to have an enemy causing a food shortage to your nation, purposefully destroying your food. That's frustrating. You would fear for your family, and you would fear for their very lives and yours. Uh, So this is the context, which uh, caused Gideon some frustration here, which we'll see. And we're going to read in verse 13. So first, verse 11 says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat... And so, by the way, the chastisement of Israel... God is going to go and speak to, uh, he's going to designate a judge, and he wants uh, the outcome to be a a safety. He he feels bad that they they are being chastised. He wants them to repent, and then he'll make things good again. Okay, so he's going to go talk to Gideon. So it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, uh, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So what was Gideon doing when we come into this story? He is hiding in the wine press while he threshed the wheat. Because if the Midianites found out what he was doing, they would come and destroy the food. So he's he's hiding, trying to, to get this food ready. So if you put yourself in Gideon's shoes, you would be pretty frustrated too, right about now, with life. Wondering, where are you, God? What's going on? Uh, so here is Gideon's conversation, verse 12. Um, it says, and the, angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And we think that way sometimes when bad things happen. It's like, if God's with us, why do you let something bad happen to me? So Gideon said, you say God is with me, then why is the enemy coming and destroying our crops and Israel is impoverished right now? It doesn't feel like God is with me. And we know the answer is that God was allowing them to suffer because they had turned from him. Gideon then says, he follows it up with the title of our lesson, and where are all his miracles? I've been reading in the scripture about what happened in the time of Moses. Where are they now? which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So in other words, I've designated you. You're going, you're going to be the one to help fix this problem. Uh, So 200 years has passed, keep this in mind, since God did anything miraculous uh, in the eyes of the children of Israel in this massive sense. And Gideon is saying, if God is with us, why doesn't he perform miracles in our day like he did back then to help us out in this generation? Where are the miracles? God saved Israel from the Egyptian oppression. Why won't he work his mighty miracles and save us from the Midianite oppression? The angel says he will in this time period. He will perform something miraculous now. He's going to do it in your day, Midian or Gideon. And he will save you from the Midianite people. The rest of this lesson, I'm not going to keep going in the story of Gideon. That's not the point of the lesson. If you would like to read that 
the outcome of that story on your own is a great story of how God delivered the Midianites uh, into Israel's hand through Gideon. I love that story. And God chose to do some miraculous things. And he made some, he gave some signs to Gideon to persuade him. Here's here. I am working through you hundreds of years after there had been no miraculous events for such a long time. So what we're going to study then for the rest of the lesson is the question that was stated by Gideon and answer it. Uh, why haven't we seen any miracles like the people who lived a long time ago? Why, as he said, have 200 years gone by and no miracles? You know, this concept can actually be a big holdup for people in the 21st century, if you don't get this, when they read about these mighty miracles and these signs from times past. They can turn people off of Christianity because they don't get it. They say, well, this must not be true. This book's full of miracles and they don't happen anymore. I don't believe in God. And they say, well, if God performed it in Bible times, why doesn't he do it today? I read in my Bible that Jesus walked on water. He was healing the sick. He was raising the dead, but I wasn't around to see that. That's just in a book. Why doesn't God do today some of what he did back then? And as Gideon asked, where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Where are all the miracles that we read in Scripture? We too, like Gideon, have the story preserved in the writings of Moses of the Red Sea crossing. We've got the same story passed on to us when God split the Red Sea. And today we can read about the manna raining down from heaven, the ten plagues, and the scary scene on Mount Sinai where God spoke to the people from the cloud and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have access to that today. That all, everything that happened. Someone today might say, but where is that kind of stuff in our generation? That we might see some of these things. Why can't we see these types of things today? And the wrong answer to this question can tremendously hurt the faith of people pursuing God. Uh, So I'd like to give you this morning three points to guide us in this discussion. I'm going to read the points up front, and then we're going to go back and dissect each one of them. So I'm just going to give it to you plainly up front. Why have we not seen any miracles? Number one, here's what we'll study. God always performed miracles in specific time periods. I might insert there from his choosing. He chose a certain, certain time periods, For specific reasons. Number two, God did not perform miracles in every generation. And now number three, we now have New Testament verification informing us that miracles have forever ceased until the return of Jesus on the last day. And so my point this morning is that God only performed miracles when he deemed suitable, when he chose And today, we'll learn that God has no need. He has not chosen to send miracles for some specific reason. Uh, He's chosen not to work in a miraculous fashion. Until Jesus comes back, he's let this thing run out. He's going to test us. We've got the word of God. He's not sending any more miracles. You shouldn't expect him in the 21st century. Now, of course, this can be a very controversial truth to some religious people, right? There are those of the Pentecostal persuasion in certain apostolic churches who swear by the fact that God is still working miracles today, uh, and he's doing them very often, they'll even say. However, it is our conviction that those types of groups claiming that God is performing miracles today make a mockery of the true miracles that once occurred. And it's really insulting that, that they're saying these things are happening when they're not. So secondly, if it is the truth that God is not performing miracles today, and that's the case, uh, then it is spiritually and intellectually dishonest to promote the idea that he is. It's false doctrine that he's performing miracles today. That can cost you your soul. If God has chosen not to perform miracles, then he has chosen not to perform miracles. And there's nothing we can do to persuade God to send a miracle if he's chosen. He's not going to, but he's going to work in a different way. And so we've studied the different way, the different operation in which he's working today through his word. But then thirdly, I also believe up front here that many from the Pentecostal persuasion have left those churches, hindering their faith, many of them, when they realize and honest people in those churches start realizing that these supposed miracles today are truly fake and forged and they leave. 
how many truth pursuing people have left the pursuit of faith when they saw groups forging fake miracles, finding them liars, saying this, this, this whole thing's a lie. I'm going to step away from it. And uh, they're promoting tricks, these tricks as if they happen through God. Uh, if God is not performing them today, then it does a whole lot of harm when people try to pretend that he is performing them today. But what, uh, we've, we've got to study the reasoning for this. We ask ourselves, okay, so why? Why is he not performing miracles today? And, and when you learn the answer, it actually makes a lot of sense and is a faith builder instead of a faith destroyer. So this, theme's le- this lesson's theme is God is not performing miracles in our day and time. And like Gideon at the start of his life, we have to be honest and we have to admit we have not seen spectacular things like we read about happening in times past. Right? Why not? And it is not that God is left without his power. Not by any means. He's got the same power. He could do anything he's done in times past. By the way, think about Gideon. If Gideon had gone back down to the Red Sea and said, well, God did it before. Let's see it part, God. Is God going to part that Red Sea? Not according to the will of God, is it? Not anymore. He did it at a certain time period. And so, simply, God has chosen in this generation to implement his power in another way. Today, his power to save mankind is defined clearly in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, as not being in the power of miracles, but in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God doesn't save through miracles today. In fact, he never saved spiritually through miracles. He did some physical safety and like with Gideon and, and Israel through miracles and stuff, but no one was ever saved and got to go to heaven by a miraculous event. Only that the miraculous event persuaded them to turn to God and that caused them to go to heaven. But most certainly today, he saves us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, that message that was stamped long ago with God's approval and verified long ago with many miracles. That's the message. And today, we need only to believe in and respond to that message without miracles. All right, so without that being said, let's go back through these three points for the remainder of our lesson and discuss using this story. So let's, let's start by working with points one and two together. We'll start here. God always performed miracles in specific time periods for specific reasons when he chose. And number two, God did not perform them in every generation. So let's talk about this. We just stated that there was a 260-year time gap between the miracles in Moses' day and the miracles that were about to take place in Gideon's day. So we read within the Bible about two to three generations of Israelites who did not get to witness God's miracles with their own eyes. Now let me ask you a few questions here. Number one, God didn't perform miracles in their day. Does that mean that God was no longer powerful or capable of miracles? No, it does not. Number two, does this mean that God had grown weaker and couldn't perform them anymore? Certainly not. Number three, then why did he not perform them? Why did he not work with miracles in their day and time for that 260-year period? The answer is because it was not within the will of God to perform miracles in those particular generations from Joshua to Gideon. And that brings us back to point number one. Let's study why it is that God chose in certain generations to perform signs and wonders and not others. Uh, So uh, one one thing I think worthy to note about God working miracles is that had he performed them in every generation, then the miracles would have become commonplace, normal, and they would have lost their power to get the attention of the people. Do you see what I'm saying? If in every generation, everyone got to see these things and their father said, oh yeah, it happened to me, it happened to your mother, it happened to, you know, God raised a person from the dead. We see it all the time. If in every generation, God allowed someone to walk on water. Oh, that's no new occurrence. I see people walk on the water all the time to heal the sick as a common occurrence, to part the seas all the time, like they did in Moses' day. If it was common, then understand this, then God would not have been able to use these signs to get the attention of people 
if they were a common occurrence. Right? There, there was a, God always has this power, but we're learning. He chose in many time periods not to use that power so that when he would use it, it would be an eye-opening experience, right? So the, the, there was a need. There was a need actually for miracles to be uncommon. There was a need for God not to do them all the time. So they'd be amazed when they came. And that's what you see in Moses' day and, and with all these miraculous stories. That's, that's why God used miracles sparingly. It wasn't a power thing, but a choice thing. And it was to get the attention of the people. And he did not use them all the time. Because he wanted to preserve the effect of miracles so that it would be an eye-opening experience when he had something that he needed to say to the new generation. Do you remember why, why uh, Nicodemus was so impressed with Jesus? As was stated in their conversation in John chapter 3, Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God. Why? For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So do you see what the miracles sent from God were designed to accomplish? You can see it in Nicodemus' response, right? Jesus, I'll let you know. I've never seen somebody do the things that you're doing in public. Now, I don't know the specific miracles that Nicodemus was privileged to see with his own eyes, but let's list some of the things that we know and read about elsewhere about Jesus in Scripture. It would be like Nicodemus saying this, Jesus, I've been alive for 50, 60 years. I've never seen anybody else walk on water. I talked to my father before me and my grandfather before him, and no one in, in any of our generations have seen someone touch a sick person with their hand and heal them on the spot. That's the power of God, and that's why we know it's, that it's you. It hasn't happened in my lifetime, nor have I ever heard of anyone happen, happen it to them in their lifetime. It's so uncommon. This never happens. That someone raised a dead person, bringing their spirit back to their body. I've never seen that before. So you see, it was important that miracles were uncommon. The miracles, what miracles accomplished is stated well by Nicodemus. These miracles could not occur unless God's hand was in it, unless God was with this individual. So we know that God is trying to get our attention. In fact, uh, the other title that I actually had in mind for this lesson was, can I have your attention, please? God would have been speaking then, right? God's purpose for miracle working was this setup. He wouldn't work them for many, many years. Let everyone grow used to the normal ways of what to expect in the normal laws of nature, the normal operation of the universe, and then, bam. If God wanted to speak to mankind when he did, a miracle would be involved to get the attention of mankind. Now, those who witnessed the true miracles knew that it meant God was speaking or about to speak. And that was the point. So if, if you want to narrow this down to three reasons, the Bible teaches us that there are, are three reasons for why God would perform miracles in times past. Um, reason number one was to designate a messenger. In Exodus chapter 4, uh, after God has uh, spoken to Moses already, revealing that he would be the spokesman for their generation, God would be speaking through him, Moses grew worried at the start, if you remember. He was very timid. Oh, I'm, I'm, going to be the, I'm going to be the messenger. Okay. He grew worried that the people would not be convinced that God really was speaking through him. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord has not, spoke, has not appeared to you. Good question. Moses, why would they just take your word for it? Some man stands up among the children of Israel and says, God has a message and he's delivering it through me. Well, you know what? Anyone could stand up. People can stand up today and tell a lie and claim that God is speaking through them. You better listen to me because God's speaking through me. And the Bible calls that individual a false prophet. 
So how would the people know that this was true, Moses asked, and not just a false claim? How are they going to know? I I know you're talking to me, but how are they going to know? Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. He said, I want you to cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand, caught it, and became a rod in his hand again. God said, Do this, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now let's do something else. Put your hand into your bosom. Right, reach into your jacket or whatever he was wearing. And he put his hand into his bosom. And he took it out. And behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Can you imagine that? He said, put your hand in your bosom again. And he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Verse 8. Then it will be that if they do not believe you, nor heed the the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that, that you shall take water from the river, here's the third one, and pour it out on dry ground. The water which you take from the river will become blood on dry ground. So God, God said, Moses, I'm, I'm designating you as my spokesman to Israel. I want you to go and, and tell them that you are my spokesman. And when they don't believe you, I'll grant you to perform these three miracles in their sight. Your rod will turn into a snake. Your hand will be leprous and then not. And then you'll pour water out on the ground and it'll become blood. These three signs. You shall perform in the sight of the children of Israel that they may know that I have sent you. Point number one of this second section, miracles identified, designated a messenger that God would be speaking through this person. That was one of the reasons. And so now we got Moses. We know he's a designated speaker of God because of the miracles. But number two, more importantly than this, Miracles designated the message that was sent from God. How would the people know that the words were actually the words of God and not the words of some man? First, he would identify a messenger through miracles, signs, and wonders. Then whatever that prophet would speak, the people would know, and it would be verified as the words of God and not man. One of God's messengers in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, said to Christians at Corinth, truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12. He said, you guys know what I did. You know what God allowed me to do when I was there. And Paul was uh, thankful for this in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. He said, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, You welcomed it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God. You get it? Paul said, I'm so thankful that you were able to be doubtless that these words I spoke were actually from God and not from my own mind. Because God would not have been granting these signs through my hands if this message originated in my mind. Therefore, you know that it's the words of God because of the signs. And if you want a theme passage for this whole lesson, Mark 16 and verse 20. The apostles went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. See what they were meant to accomplish? Uh, This is how the world knew Jesus to be a true messenger. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 and verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, listen to this part. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him God has raised up. 
and I like how he, he, he said to the crowd, this isn't anything new. You know what he did in your midst. So miracles identified a messenger. Miracles identified the message. In scripture, only one, one of the only exceptions to this that I can think of uh, is the prophet John the baptizer who performed no sign, John 10, verse 41. John's an interesting character for this reason. The text says, John performed no sign. But all the things that John spoke about this man were true. So John was foretold to simply be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness before the coming of the great Messiah. So, uh, so it seems that God limited John's ministry to perform preaching from the word alone, turn into the Old Testament scripture, and working through preaching before the Messiah came, not miracles, as the voice foretelling of the Messiah, crying out that the people would, uh, that they would respond to this message without miracles. And then came the miracles. But uh, this was the exception, okay? John the baptizer not performing miracles was the exception and not the norm. When God would speak through an individual, he would typically and always send a sign. Uh, but the way it typically worked is that God would identify his messengers in this way. That way the people would know, oh, these are the words of God. Uh, but then number three, and this is the important part for us today, the miracles of the individual that God uh, enabled could then be counted upon in future generations as scriptural authority. So number three un under this section, the purpose of miracles was to designate the scriptures. Okay, so Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul performed miracles. Uh, they were written down of what he did, and now we know that the writings that he wrote were from God because he was a miracle worker. Moses performed miracles. Peter, the Apostles, the close associates with the Apostles, thus the canon of Scripture was established in this way. When, God, when these uh, God-inspired men wrote these things down, preserved for future generations. Uh, all scripture is God-breathed in this way. That's how you designate the scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, For prophecy never came by the will of man. Right? We talked about Paul. Paul didn't come up with it. It wasn't his will. He said, but here's how it worked. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So going back to our three main points this morning, point number one, God always performed miracles in specific time periods for specific reasons. He wanted to send a message to mankind. Thus, what he would do is identify a messenger through whom to speak through miracles, and he'd speak through them. Then the message was verified through the miracles. Then the scripture could be written down, and it could be established for future generations. That's how it worked. But then, number two, here's the key. God did not do this in every generation. Let's study that. You might remember also just before God called the prophet Samuel to help lead Israel and to prophesy to them. First Samuel chapter three and verse one said, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. So get this, just like in Gideon's day, the text says about the generation leading up to the great prophet Samuel that God would designate up until that point, there's a time period there where God rarely spoke to mankind in those generations. It was a silent time period where God chose not to speak at all vocally to the people, but to let them dwell, let them exist and be tested by his laws in the absence of miracles and direct communication. So in scripture, we learn about a lot of these gap time periods where, where after God would designate a prophet and a message through these mighty signs, wonders, and miracles, that then he would let, he would let off the gas, so to speak, for a, for a couple of generations. And then he'd speak to somebody else. Although God never had the power, uh, although God had the power at any time to perform the miracle, he chose not to in the majority of time periods. See, I, th I think we get confused about this when we read Scripture. Because uh, you read about, we, we read the Bible, and every other story has something miraculous involved in it. Uh, but what we don't consider is that in between all these stories were these time periods of silence and non-miraculous events throughout all the ages. 
There was, there was more time in human history where God was not performing miracles than when he was. So God didn't work uh, through miracles all the time. Not even back then. He merely decided when to use them when wanting to establish a teaching, a message, or a revelation sent for mankind to follow. Before John the Baptizer showed up, by the way, you remember what some have called the 400 years of silence in between the, the two Testaments. From the end of Malachi to the beginning of Matthew, there was 400 years where evidently God sent no messenger, gave no instruction, no new instruction, revealed no miraculous power, but he waited for the time when the final messenger would be sent, who is Jesus Christ. Point number three, we, we don't have time to do this point justice. This could be another lesson if we wanted to. But if, if, if any of you have questions about point number three, feel free to come up and we can study this after if you have any questions. But number three, we have studied this a lot, by the way. We now have New Testament verification that miracles have forever ceased until the return of Jesus on the last day. So I'll give you a couple of verses as we close here because uh, we won't be able to make this point full out and, and explain it fully for sake of time. But first, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 is a good one. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Tie that in. Jude chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about the religious setup brought in their time period with Jesus and the apostles. And it was known as the faith of Jesus Christ and how the faith, listen, was once for all delivered to the saints. Set up back then. The message was given to them in the first century. And the idea we're studying this morning is that after that miraculous time period, when the message was verified, it would be followed up by an, uh, uh, another one of these long, non-miraculous time periods. We're still in that time period. Generation after generation who would not get to see these miracles. John chapter 20 and verse 31 says, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So the point is, God, God knew. He had to set this up and he knew he would not be sending miracles in every generation that followed after the first century. God knew that the faith delivered to those individuals was final and it was the final authority stamped with his approval for all time until Jesus came back. And Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 48, that the word that I have spoken will be the judge of him in the last day. I, I gave it to you and now you're being tested by it. You're going to be judged by it. I mean, I'm sending no, don't expect any new revelations. This is it. We've got it. Second Peter 1.3 he said, he, he, all things have been given to us that pertain unto life and godliness. We have the whole package. We should not be expecting a new revelation. Any new prophet that says, I got a new message from God. He's a liar and a false prophet. God doesn't talk through people anymore. This is what we have. So the idea is, is hey, the Godhead has spoken. And we leave you with this set of teachings as your guide. The Scripture. Scripture, the God-breathed Scripture that is able to make you complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, that the man of God may be complete. And he said this to all generations who follow, the word that I delivered in the first century will be your judge on the judgment day. And so that's what we've got. And of course, you could go to and study some of the other passages uh, on your own that specifically identify the miraculous age as ceasing once the message was fully delivered, Ephesians 4 and verse 13, 1 Corinthians 13, 10, which says, when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part the miraculous gifts will be done away. So it was foretold that the gifts wouldn't last throughout the whole Christian age. They would start the Christian age and they would stop. So the miracles were only to last for a little while to fully establish our truth and the power of God, Romans 1.16, is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach that to people, and people all over the world will get to go to heaven, never having seen a miracle, because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God to save, not miracles.
Uh, so that is our lesson for today. If you're not a Christian, you you got to believe what happened back then and trust it with all your heart that this is the message that God sent from heaven. you got to believe in Jesus and obey the gospel. you got to hear that word, believe it, repent of your sins, turn away from your sins, confess him before men, and be baptized in water to enter this awesome kingdom that's been purchased by the blood of Christ. And then you just remain faithful until the day you die. After you've entered in through baptism, we just got to keep the covenant, keep faithful. And when you slip up, just pray to God about it. Confess that sin and repent. Move on. Keep going. Be faithful. And you will have the crown of life. Uh, So that is our lesson. If anybody uh, has any need to come today, don't leave here with your life not right with God. Uh, Please come if you have any need. As together we stand and sing.